feel like you need to move, you move. Hallelujah. We've come to worship Him. We've come to pour our hearts out on Him this morning. Oh, God, we thank you for your love this morning, Lord. We thank you for that love, oh, God, this morning. Hallelujah. We thank you for that love that kept you nailed to a cross for us, oh, Lord. We thank you for that love, oh, God. We thank you for that love, oh, God, this morning. We rose again, oh, Jesus. We thank you for that love. We thank you for that love, oh, God, this morning. Open your hearts to you and Jesus this morning. Mm, an audience of one this morning. Just open your heart to him this morning. Just love on him.
is an all time forever for free love. His is not a merit based love. Let's wait and see, love. I'll hold on. His is forever for free. His is not a merit based love. Let's wait and see, love. His is a forever for free love. He doesn't hold back his love from you. He doesn't hold back his love from you. He loves you. He loves you. He doesn't hold back his love from you. He doesn't hold back his love from you. He loves you. He loves you. While Krista was singing that, I saw a child in a corner, and that child was, was drawn up, and they were trying to protect themselves. Something had happened to this child, and they're trying to protect themselves, and they're afraid. I see a big hand reaching out to that child who's crawled up in that corner, and he, the child is shaking. The child is scared to come out. The child might have done something. I don't know. The child might have be, be feeling guilty for something. The child might have been abused. I'm not sure what's wrong with this child. I got a feeling there's all sorts of things because there's all sorts of people in here this morning. But God wants you to know He is reaching out His hand to you this morning and His love is unconditional. This is what Chris is singing about. It's not about who you are and what your gifts are this morning. It's not about what you've done for Him this morning. But we're all the children this morning. We're all His children this morning. And He's our Daddy God. And I'm not sure what you've been through or what you're going through now but I see God reaching out this morning and he's saying come to me I'm your father I want to be your father this morning you don't have anything to be scared of I'm not going to hit you I'm not going to abuse you I'm not going to torment you I'm not going to beat you down with my words but I'm going to draw you into me this morning with my love my love is unconditional it's a different kind of love that this world offers you today my love is unconditional today and I want you to draw you into you to me this morning. I want to draw you into my lap this morning. I want you to draw and put your head on my chest this morning to hear my heartbeat. I want you to feel my love, this love, this love, but with child, but child, will you look up from the corner? But child that is trembling and is scared, is just scared this morning. Will you look up this morning and see me? Will you see me? Will you put your hand in my hand this morning? Will you allow me to draw you out? Will you allow me to pick you up? You have nothing to fear from me this morning. My love is unconditional. And it's a healing love this morning. It's a healing love this morning. It's a healing love. And I love you, child, this morning. He sees you. He sees you. Oh, he sees you. You don't have to wait to the end of the service this morning to get things straight with God. You don't have to wait to the end of service to, to, to accept this love. But right now, where He is, His presence is in this place this morning. From the time you've walked in this morning, His presence is here. And He's saying, open up your heart right where you are right now. Come on, child. Open your heart. Come to Daddy God this morning. I'm right here. This, uh, you have nothing to fear. I'm right here. I'm right here with you. I'm right here with you this morning. Hallelujah. Come on out of your corner you don't have to protect yourself daddy God is reaching for you he sees you he's a great big loving God this morning come on out of your corner you don't have to protect yourself Daddy God is reaching for you. He's reaching. Just where you He's are right now. He's reaching. Just how you are right now. Come on out of your corner. Come on out of your corner. You don't have to protect yourself. 
you don't have to protect Daddy yourself. Oh, his arms are big. His love is big this morning. Daddy God is reaching for you. Daddy God is reaching for you because he loves you. Yeah, he loves you. protect yourself you don't have to protect yourself daddy god is reaching for you daddy god is reaching for you he loves you yeah he loves you protect yourself you don't have to protect yourself March 1st and March 2nd is going to be right here uh, on the campus and it's going to be Friday night and it's going to be all day Saturday uh, we're providing free child care we're providing uh, snacks and a meal on Saturday and the cost is $45 per couple and I hope you will sign up I, we need you to go ahead and sign up if you're thinking about coming you can do it online. There's a flyer on the, there's a, a, a form on the back table there. You can fill out. You can pay, write a check or give us cash also. But I hope you'll come if you're married. I hope if you, if you aren't married, uh, you would volunteer. We need helpers. We want to put this thing on in an excellent way. God would have us do everything excellent. Amen. Amen. And we got other churches uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, community involved. It's just not just us. We've got several Baptist churches and a couple of independent churches. We have several of our churches. Fountain of Life is going to be involved. Uh, Calvary is going to be involved. Our Father's House and Shiloh is going to be involved as well. So I hope you'll sign up. And the other thing is, if you know a couple, if you know a married couple that's not saved, that doesn't go to church, this is a really non-threatening way for them to come and hear the gospel. They do a great job of, of, of sharing the gospel. So uh, you might want to sponsor them. And if you're here today and you want to come, and you don't have the money, you just let, let me know, let Walter know, and uh, William know, and uh, Barbie, and Robin, and or Crystal. Uh, we're the team that's from the church, and we'll see that you get there. Amen? Amen? We've got these manuals over here. We've been praying over them on Monday nights, and uh, I've been praying over them times coming to the church. Uh, uh, did you go online to see if anybody registered? To my estimation, we have about 18 or 20 couples, so we're halfway there. We've got 40 books, so we need to continue to pray. Uh, Tom's in charge of the prayer wars. If you want to help pray and be part of that team, see Tom. Or is going to be coordinating the food here at this, this place. We also have somebody that's going to do it at the other church where we're doing child care, so see her. Uh, we also need other help, administrative help and everything. Uh, Tammy's doing the music. Uh, Brian's working on going to do the audio and video. So we're all excited. Amen. So let's just take a moment. You join me. Reach out your hand. Let's pray for these manuals. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that we've got uh, we, between 18 and 20 couples signed up. Lord, but we need 40. We need 40 souls and 40 marriages who need uh, just a jolt from God, whether they're, they have a good marriage and they want to make it great or their marriage is struggling. And especially those that come that don't know you as Savior and Lord, we pray that this conference would be the time that they, both the husband and the, and the wife give their heart to you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thank you. Also, how many know many hands make a burden light? Amen. Uh, we are going to, there's three pews up in the sound room, and we're going to be taking them down after church. We're going to put some straps on them, and we're going to cover that stuff there, and we're going to lower them down out of that window, and we're going to put them here on the ground, and we're going to take them. So if you're here, young men, uh, you know, strong backs, and you can help us out, Brian and, and I, Scott, and a couple others, if you can, uh, that are here, uh, you can help us. I'm, I've got the stuff at the house. I'm going to run home after church and get it. So if you can stick around and help us, we would appreciate it. All right, let's get into our lesson for today. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Now, I got my funny glasses on because 
I'm, I'm halfway there. Have you ever been halfway there? I got one eye done on my cataract surgery, and I see perfect out of one eye. Thus, I have no lens in here. See that? There's no lens here. But my other eye still is, is 2050 or 2060 or whatever it is, so I got to have a lens in this side. So I know it looks funny, but it works. Amen? Amen. Matthew chapter 5. We're talking about a series uh, dealing with how to have an impact on our culture. And we're going to go through this Sermon on the Mount with, the, with the, the quest of being able to impact the culture in which we live. And this morning I'd like to read from Matthew uh, chapter 5 verse 3 through verse 12. It's in red, so who's speaking? Jesus. Yes, Jesus is speaking. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every one here today. I thank you for those that are listening to me, Lord, and listening to you. Holy Spirit, we know that your job is to counsel, to comfort, and convict. So, Lord, each one is here for a divine appointment this morning. It's not by accident they're here. You have brought them here this morning. So, Holy Spirit, we give you freedom to move in each life. And let, let our eyes be open to see beyond the natural. Let our ears be open to hear beyond the natural, Lord. Let our minds be open. To, and, Lord, we block any spirit of deception right now. We block anything that's not of Christ this morning. We declare this to be holy ground. We declare this to be a holy place this morning. We declare an atmosphere of faith. We declare an atmosphere of rejoicing. We declare an atmosphere of mercy and forgiveness. So we bind every spirit, any negative spirit, and we loose the Spirit of God in this place today. And we ask this in the wonderful, matchless name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. What Jesus Christ has given us here are nine attitudes. Nine attitudes that will determine our altitude. Now Webster in his 1828 dictionary defines attitude as this. Now the reason I say, you say, Pastor, why don't you get with it? 1828 is a long time ago. You Don't you know there's a 2010 Webster's dictionary? I know that. But Webster, how many know Webster was a Christian? Yes. Webster was a Christian. And Webster in his 1828 dictionary defined the words in there. And you're going to find every word in there because some of the words didn't even exist then or weren't in the culture. But all, every word that's in there, he defines from a biblical standpoint. So if you want to know what a word means from the translators from the Greek and the Hebrew and the English, and you want to know what it means in a Christian context, Webster took the time to research that, and, and I believe he was led by the Holy Spirit. So that's why I, my dictionary is kind of old, amen? It's an oldie but a goodie, amen? amen? Attitude. Now this is what I found interesting. Attitude. In a painting and a sculpture, the position or action in which a figure or statue is placed, the gesture of figure or statue, such a disposition of the parts as serves to express the action and sentiments of the person represented. So, how many of you ever seen a lot of statues? I, I've been overseas, especially in Italy. They got statues everywhere. You know, you got the, the Atlas, the guy, the Atlas, you know, you got the, the thinker and everything. So, so what, the, what that Greek word, what at, attitude means, and what, what Webster is telling us, it's, it's a position. An attitude is a position that you're in. It's not a chill bump. Right. It's not a feeling. It's not just getting a bunch of self-talk up in you, but it's a rather a position that you're in. So attitude is putting ourselves in the right position to achieve the greatest altitude. Amen. 
Let me say that again. Attitude is putting ourselves in the right position to achieve the greatest attitude. Now, attitude, Webster defines attitudes as space extended upward. That's the key, upward. The elevation of an object, lifting something up from where it's at. The elevation of an object or place above the surface on which we stand or above the earth, the elevation of one object above another, as of a bird ab above the top of the tree. Attitude is about position. Altitude is about elevation. Attitude is about position, and altitude is about elevation. Jesus had an attitude. How many know that? Yeah. Now, of course, we, we, you know, people say, well, she's got an attitude, or he's got an attitude, kind of a negative thing. But really, an attitude is not a feeling or not how you respond to something. It's a position. So Paul talks about this, and I, got this, I have this in your bulletin. Philippians 2, 5 through 1. This is from the New Living Translation. Because I think the words there really describe what we want to talk about this morning. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus did. How many want to have the attitude that Christ has? I want to have the attitude that he had. I want to have the heart that he had. I want to have the compassion that he had. I want to have the mind that we How many know we can do that? Yeah. How many know we can do that? God is trying to work into you today and to work into me to transform us, conform us, put us on the, the potter's wheel, and mold us into Jesus Christ. Amen. And the thing is that so blows my mind is God sees us as Jesus Christ. Wow. My mind go boom. God sees us as Jesus, and that's, this is just like sanctification. Sanctification, we are sanctified, and we are being sanctified. It's a process. Yes, amen. So when he says, Jesus had this attitude, and we should have, this is what he says. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You see, Jesus' attitude was that of a humble servant. When, remember the temptation in the wilderness. Remember Jesus was baptized. He was baptized by John in the Jordan. He comes up out of the water Something like a dove comes and falls on him, which is the Holy Spirit. This is a Trinitarian experience. We have Jesus, we have the dove, and then we have a voice from heaven that says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then after that, Jesus goes in the desert. He doesn't eat for 40 days. And that old uh, slew foot, the devil, comes and tries to attack him. And what he does is, he, the Jesus does not take on the devil from his son of God. Manifesto, he takes it on from his son of man manifesto. Amen. Which means the attitude that Christ showed in confronting the devil, we can have that attitude. Amen? Amen? We can have that position. It's ours to possess. So Jesus was very humble. He was a humble servant. Even though Jesus is one day going to come back and this look at what is going to happen. He humbled himself and now it's going to elevate him. He's going to, his attitude is going to be lifted up. Verse 9, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, someday, soon, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. That's going to happen. Yes. Now, everybody's going to do it, whether you believe in Jesus or not. I feel sorry for people that don't think that Jesus existed. I feel sorry for people that think that Jesus is a fairy tale, that Jesus is a story. Do you realize what it's going to be like to be, pre to be pressed down by the power of God to your knees? And not only that, to be pressed upon your tongue and be pressed upon your vocal cords and be pressed upon your diaphragm to speak out that name, that name that you denied, that name that said you didn't exist, that name that said you're just a fairy tale. Can you imagine? I can't and I don't want to. Amen? 
because I, I, you, you won't have to push me. You won't have to tap me. I'll be on my knees. Amen? Amen. Because I'm, I'm, I'm already there. See, practicing humility, practicing the elevation of God in our life doesn't start when we get to heaven. It starts today. Amen? That's how we get to heaven. Amen? So God, Jesus had an attitude of a humble servant, and that attitude elevated him. So what's, what's in the lesson for us? What's our attitude should be? Well, Paul says it. You must have the same attitude that Christ had. What, what did he have? He had this. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. How many know some people think that them or God are tight? That, that it's God and them. It's God and Don Incorporated. Come on, God, you and I together. You know, we're going to work that you, you, come on, you can give me your opinion and I have my opinion and we're going to work this thing out and, and together we can do it. That, that's equality with God. There are a lot of people today, secular humanists, that believe that the power is in them and God is just kind of like a source they can plug into. But see, that's not going to get you there. Amen? You're not equal with God. You couldn't, you couldn't stand a nanosecond in God's presence and take him on. Amen? Uh, you would be just a, uh, with a flick of his finger, you would be just a piece of dust on the ground. Amen? You cannot stand with God. You cannot, you cannot, you're too, what's that, that, that play on Broadway? Your arms are too short to box with God. Amen? There was a cartoon several years ago in, the, in our newspaper. Uh, it was a Christian newspaper we used to get. And it had, it had the caption was, God plays Jeopardy. And the two contestants had zero, and, dot, and God had 23 billion, killion, jillion. Amen? He knew all the answers. You can't, you, can't, you can't be equal with God. You can't think of yourself as on the same plane with him. You have to realize, look, that's, that's what I want in a God. I used to work with juvenile delinquents, and they always used to ask me, well, who made God? And I said, nobody made God. God is the beginning and the end of all things. Well, they said, well, somebody had to make God. And I said, no, because whoever made God then becomes God. Amen? I don't want just the person that made this earth. I want the person that thought of it and created I want the person, look, my God, I need a God that's bigger than me. If I'm relying on my own intelligence, I'm in big, big trouble. I need a God that thinks higher than me. I need a God that sees higher than me. Look, God sees everything. God sees, my, God sees my life like he's standing on a tower and there's a big parade coming by. He sees the, the beginning of the parade with the, with the banners and the bands and then he sees all the parade with all the animals and the horses and then he sees the guy with the shovel that picks up the poop. Amen? Can I say poop in church? I guess it's too late. I just did. Anyway, but that's how God sees my life and sees your life. But see, we just see it one step along the parade route. Amen? I like that. If I saw what's going to happen in my life, if I, look, when I was 18, if I saw where I'd be at 59, I would have had a heart attack gave, and, and fallen over dead. I don't want to see what's going to happen in the next five years. I'm just happy taking one day at a time. Amen. Amen? I'll put it in his hands. So we're to have that same kind of attitude. We're to humble ourselves in obedience to God, and we're to die. Yeah. We're to die. Christ died. We're to die to self. Yes. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Paul writes, but Christ who lives in with me. And of course, if we have that kind of attitude, our altitude will be God elevates us to the place of highest honor and will give us a name that's a ball of... How many know that when you become a Christian, you get a new name? Amen. We should sing that song. There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh yes, it's mine. I forget the rest of the words. But anyway, we get a new name. And we are going to rule and reign in heaven. Amen? I'm going, to be char I'm going to be in charge of some of you. So be nice to me now. Amen? <laughs> We're going to rule and reign in heaven. So we, get, we, we can have the same attitude, humility, servanthood, obedience, and death to self. And that will elevate us up. Now each of these nine attitudes that will adjust our altitude begins with the same word. And they begin with the word blessed. Blessed. Now, I, I was excited. If you were in my house Saturday, I was just jumping for joy. Because God is so intricate. God is, God is in everything. Amen? God is even in words. Now, watch this. This word blessed, the Greek root of this word, 
and this is taken from Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the Greek root for this word blessed refers to a marketplace, a position, a marketplace. This is what Kittle writes. The arrangements of such markets is known to us from excavations. The arrangements of the court seem to be ev- the same everywhere. So what he's saying, this word, this root word for this right here, that describes a market that was made the same throughout the empire, throughout the, the, the Greek world and the Roman world. A rectangular court of pillars, now watch this, with a fountain in the middle of it. Do you understand? Jesus says he's the fountain of living water. Jesus says you will have living waters flowing. So this place, this blessed thing that we're going to have is a place where living waters, where water is going to flow. The the living water of God is going to flow. A rectangular court of pillars with a fountain in the middle and over it, supported by pillars, a dome-shaped roof, a covering. How many know we have a covering today? We have a covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. We have a covering of God. We have a covering of obedience. We have a covering of authority. Hallelujah. Isn't God smart? Amen. He's involved in even the etymology of the words that we use. It had a dome-shaped roof, booths all around on the sides, and in each of one of them there was a porch, and there was always a chapel that represent a religious presence. Isn't that awesome? That's the root word for blessed. What's important to understand that this being blessed is not a chill bump. Amen? It's not a, some commentators translate this word as happy. I don't, don't, well, if you think happy as as a place, then that's fine. But if you think happy as a feeling, you're wrong. This is not a feeling. It's not a feel-good thing to make you feel good. Amen? It's a, it's got, Jesus is trying through these nine attitudes to, this, to get us to a position so that we can have some altitude. Amen? Yeah. So he's trying to do that. So the, the base of this word points right to that. Now, the, the word itself is eulaga. And we get the word eulogy. That's where we get our word eulogy. And it's, back then, it just it meant that. The, this word was only used, the, this Greek word for blessed was only associated with death. So back then, if I said, you are God to you, that means you are blessed because you're dead. That's right. And you know, you, then watch this. this. This is so neat if you get this. There's, the, there's Greek thinking and there's Hebrew thinking. Yeah. This is Greek thinking. Socrates and the rest of those guys at the time, they believed that the, the, the greatest place, the greatest thing that could happen to you was to die. They believed death was the ultimate perfection. They believed that this body that we have is just to be suffered and indulged in and that the, the spirit and the soul are the bubbly. The mind is everything. What we think, our personality, the body doesn't really matter. So they, can, they separated the spirit and the soul from the body. Matter of fact, when Socrates, he went on trial in Athens for for treason. And listen, he was on treason not for what he did. It's treasons for what he thought. He was on treason for having ideas that were contradictory to the ideas of the city-state of Athens. So Socrates said in his defense, he said, I want you to kill me. I want you to sentence me to death. Because when you sentence me to death, then and then will I only be Yulaga. I will be blessed. Only then, when I'm dead, will I be free. Only then will I be in the perfect state that I want to be in. And so many of you know the story. He was found guilty. And back then, they didn't take you out and shoot you. They didn't hang you. And they didn't give you... They didn't, what they did is they gave you a poison. It was called hemlock. And you would drink this poison. It was a slow-acting poison. And when gradually it was, it was a paralyzing agent and usually started at the feet and it'd work its way up and eventually, eventually it would paralyze your heart and your lungs and you would die. So he drank the poison and he died. His last, in his last words, Socrates declares that he was finally blessed, Yulaga, because he was at total freedom. His soul and mind were separated from his body. Now that's Greek thinking, you see. That's what's taught mostly in our schools, in our secular schools. Greek thinking. The mind is the ultimate. How often have you heard liberals say, all we need to do is educate people. Amen? Well, I've been around since 1953, and I've been going to school 
for a long time. I've got my, my, got my bachelor's, I got my master's degree, and I, I'll tell you what, the government has spent a lot of money on education, and it hasn't worked. We don't have a better society than we had before, do we? When I went to school, the worst thing I had to worry about was uh, smoking in the boys' room. Now you have to worry about people bursting into the school and killing you. Amen? So intelligence is not the answer. The mind is not the answer. But Hebrews, now see the Hebrews, they believe that you have to combine all three parts. You have to combine, I, I go with the heart, which is the, the, the spirit, and the mind and the personality, which is the soul, and of course the body. They believe that all three have to work together. That you can't separate it. You see, Greek thinking allows John Kerry, when he was running for president, to say, well, I'm a Roman Catholic, and I know the Roman Catholics believe that abortion is a sin, but I, I, I don't, I'm not going to vote my religion. I'm going to vote my intelligence. See, Hebrew thinking doesn't allow that. Hebrew thinking doesn't allow the separate. What you do with your body affects your heart and your mind, and what you, do with your, what you think with your mind accepts your heart. You see, it all works together. That's Greek thinking. And this is creeping into our, into, our, into our country. Matter of fact, it's not creeping, it's taking control. How many of you ever heard of the Hemlock Society? They're, they're, they're in every state of the union, and in several states of the union now, you know that it's, it's legal for physician-assisted suicide. It's illegal for a physician to prescribe, you, to, to prescribe you something, and you go to him and say, I want to kill myself. He doesn't have to turn you in. He doesn't have to get you psychiatric help. He just writes a prescription and you go home and take it and you die. See, life, life is now in, not in control of God. Life's now in control of our humanness. And guess what? I don't like that. Because I, don't want, I want God to be in control. Amen? Amen? So they've pushed for these laws. And of course, one of the things, the, the latest one that was passed was in the state of Washington. And I, I lived in the state of Washington years ago. But you know, the state of Washington is the most unchurched state besides Hawaii in the United States. Did you know that? Less people go to church in Washington than, Hawaii and Washington than any other state in the United States of America. So doesn't it make sense if they don't go to church, they don't have a godly influence that they would think this is okay? How about around the world? You know, the three, the three countries in the world that have the most assisted suicide are Switzerland, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and all three are godless states. All three are where we're going to be someday if we don't have an impact on the culture in which we live. Amen? So Jesus, you see the power of Christ in this? You see the power of Christ? Christ takes a word, yulaga, that means death, and he turns it around and said, you know what? I'm going to supernaturally change this word. It doesn't mean death anymore. It means life. It means a good position. It needs a great place to be in. You know, when we are blessed, when we're in that position, each of these nine attitudes is going to elevate us to an altitude. We will be elevated to the place where we can be. We will be called the sons and daughters of God. We'll be elevated to a place where we will be filled and we'll obtain mercy and see mercy. We'll, we'll, we'll rule and we're going to be rulers and reigning from heaven. We will rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is our reward in heaven. It's always been God's desire to have us in a place where we're blessed. That's where we started. Amen? Amen. That's where the human race started. Listen, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. He's talking to Adam and Eve now. God blessed them. God put them in a place. Where did they, God put them? In the garden, right? In the garden of Eden. They were in a place. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So when you're in the right place with God, you'll be what? Fruitful and you'll what? Multiply. Amen? Jesus said, I am the branch. I am the vine and you are the branches and you will bear what? Fruit. What kind of fruit? Much fruit. Amen? See, it, it started in Genesis 1, and it's still around. God wants us to be in that garden place. And right now, it's not a physical garden. It's a spiritual garden. To be fruitful and to multiply, which means, to me, to make disciples. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the earth, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
Now, the word blessed in Hebrew means one who is in a special place. Were Adam and Eve in a special place? Amen. Am I in a special place in Christ? Amen. I hope you did the study last week. The assignment was to read in Christ scriptures every day and then on the Friday to read them all. I mean, they really blessed me. I got, I'm gonna, uh, I've got that and I'm going to use that. But I'm in a special place because I'm in Christ. Amen. Amen. It means one who is a special place, a special relationship with God, a place where the individuals trust God, fears God, and loves God. Abram was blessed. Listen, Genesis 14, 18, and 19. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, for he was priest of God most high. It was Jesus. How many know Melchizedek was Jesus? If you have any argument, argue with the writer of Hebrews. It says Melchizedek was Jesus. And he, this is Melchizedek, and he, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Abraham was in a place, or Abram was in a place, a special relationship with God, God most high, a place where Abraham was a possessor. Amen. I want to be a possessor. I want to be a, 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 a possessor so I'm not an oppressor. Amen. Amen. I want to be a possessor of the things of God. And, and somebody that's a possessor of things of God is not an oppressor. He doesn't oppress himself. He doesn't allow the devil to oppress him. He doesn't oppress other people. And the word oppress means to push down, to put a heavy weight upon. Look, some of you have, have been oppressed by other Christians or so-called Christians. They've put some legalistic thungs, things on you. Thou shall not. Thou shall not do this. Thou shall not wear this. Thou shall not listen to this. Thou shall not do that. It's not about doing the don'ts. It's about doing the do's. Amen. Preacher once said, and I, I remember it when I was young, if you do the do's, you won't have time to do the don'ts. So it's not about what you wear. It's not about all that stuff. It's about who you are because holiness starts from the inside and works its way out. Amen? Amen? Israel was blessed. God chose the children of Israel to be blessed, to be in a special place, to be in a special relationship with him. Listen to Deuteronomy 28, chapter, uh, chapter 28, verses 3 through 6. Blessed shall you be. The position you shall be in. This is the position Israel was in. The position you shall be in in the city. And you shall be in a good position in the country. Blessed be the fruit of your body the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herbs, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. The position God wants us to be in is a position of increase. I want God to increase, and I want to decrease. Just like John the Baptist said. He, Jesus, must increase, and I, John the Baptist, must decrease. In my life, I found the more of God and the less of me, the better it works. Amen. Because I don't know too much. You know, I got to, every thought I have, I have to check against the word of God and check against God. Because, you know, the devil, that's where he, he operates in the thoughts. Amen? He tries to plant thoughts. Like some of you right now, he's planting thoughts in your head. He's trying to get you to blow off what I'm saying. He's trying to get you to, to figure out who's going to win the Super Bowl tonight. Amen? He's trying, to, he's trying to disconnect you from being connected to what you're hearing right now. See, that's the devil. And, and God wants you to, to cast that off in the name of Jesus. And God wants us to increase in him and decrease in ourselves. So the nation of Israel was supposed to be an increaser, not a decreaser. Blessed shall your baskets be and your kneading bowls. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. Wherever Israel went, they're supposed to be an increaser, not a decreaser. Well, you know what? Israel, the nation of Israel, truly was the apple of God's eye. Yes, it was. But you know what? They didn't, they didn't do what Christ did. They didn't have the attitude that was in Christ. They did not humble themselves. They did not obey God. They did not crucify the flesh. What they did is they were the apple of God's eye. They were in a special place, and they choose to step out of that place. How sad. And I can't help but think of the nation of Israel and think of our own country, the United States of America. You know that once Israel was a world power, they ruled the then known world. The kingdom of David and Solomon was equal to the Roman Empire or the British Empire. Any empire you want to name. 
They had people from all over the world sending them gold. Silver was so common, so common in Solomon's time that it was like a penny we have today. That's how great they were. But they fell. And you know, our country was once really great. And I love this country. But I'm telling you, I, I believe in my lifetime I've seen the pinnacle of the United States because all I see now in the future is down, 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 down. But you know what? We can change that. We can change that. God can use us. God can use you. God doesn't need a majority. Amen? Amen. I talked about it last week. Just one person. Dedicated to God can change. Little Mother Teresa, who never had more than probably $20, $30 to her name. She would go places and presidents. I remember one time President Clinton and Hillary went to hear her speak. And here she is, and there was other senators there and, and important people. And she got up there in her little ragged old dress and her little sandals and she got up there and she took that little bony finger. She was about 60-some years old. And she was, she's worked all her life. She was gnarled up. Her hands were gnarled up. And she, was, she was skinny. She took that old little bony skinny finger and she stuck it in front of all those people in President Clinton's face. And she shamed him because he believed in abortion. And you know what he said? Nothing. The power of God. The power of the individual to change things. This sermon, this series, the Sermon on the Mount and how to have an impact on today's secular culture that will help us to have the right attitude to be in a position so that we can gain altitude to be lifted up from being in a position of decline. Remember, the Greeks used to have that word and it meant death. Now, for us, it means life. A position of life. And you know what? We can be the one lighting the candle in the darkness. Have you ever been in a completely dark room or a dark space? I was on a ship. And uh, the ship has the, uh, uh, the, the main deck and then everything above the main deck is the old one level, old two level, old three level, old four level. Everything below the main deck is deck one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so on, so on. Well, I've been to the very bottom of a ship. The, 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 it's, it's underwater. There's no, there's no, you, you don't want to open a window. Amen? And the lights were turned off. And I, the first time in my life, when I first went to the Navy, I was in the, that space, and, and darkness grabbed a hold of me. I don't know if you've ever been that way, but it's so dark, you can't, you can't see anything. You can't hold your hand up and see it. Dark becomes like a cloth covering your head. But in the midst of that total darkness where everything was closed in on me, I lit a little flashlight, a little pen light. And you know what? It lit up the whole space. It chased away the darkness. Amen? Amen. And we're going to talk about more of that when we get into the Sermon on the Mount. Last week I shared the story about being a prairie chicken. How many here are prairie chickens? Prairie chicken. It was a, a, an eagle's egg that was put in with a bunch of prairie chicken eggs and of course you know what a prairie chicken is it's kind of a scrawny little bird and they they peck at little little worms and little bugs on the ground and they usually live in a dry arid place of the desert and they can't fly very far they kind of do all this fluttering and flashing and they can only fly a couple feet they're not a very pretty bird and they're not a very useful bird so the eagle's egg was hatched with the prairie chickens and this eagle grew up thinking he was a prairie chicken and he pecked at the dirt and ate little bugs and uh, he, you know, tried to fly, but it was very pitiful. And one day as he was doing this, he saw an eagle flying above and he turned to his other prairie chicken brother and he said, what's that? What's that beautiful thing flying up there so high in the sky, so majestic? And the other prairie chicken said, oh, that's, that's the eagle. He said, that's the, that's the king of all birds. But don't trouble your heart. You're just a prairie chicken. You can never be an eagle. You see, and we talked about how it's what Satan does to us. He confines us to pecking at the ground, to focusing on the things of earth, and not lifting our head up to soar on the winds of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So I want to challenge us this morning to be eagles. I want to challenge us to set our hearts and set our minds on achieving the highest altitude that we can. As we go through these nine attitudes, these nine positions that we can be in, we're going to see us 
as being raised up and getting higher and higher and higher and flying into the sky. I want the musicians to come on up and the praise team to come on up. So how will we change our culture? We will change our culture by our attitude will affect our, our attitude will affect the attitude of others and our altitude will affect the altitude of others. Look in your bulletin there, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 and 10. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? That he also descended into the lower parts of the earth and he who descended is also the one who ascends far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. What does that mean? That means that Jesus, first he descended to come down here and slog it out with us. He became one of us. He was fully man. He, he, he knew what it was to be discouraged. He knew what it was to have heartache. His own family tried to commit him to the insane asylum. His best friend betrayed him to death. His, all his other 11 friends turned their back on him in his greatest time of need. He knew what it was to lose a loved one. Lazarus died. He knew what it was to be hungry. He was without food for 40 days. He knew what it was to, to, to feel the things that we feel. The Bible says he, he suffered in everything that we suffer from emotionally. Christ did that. Christ, Christ was that. And, and you know what? We are the sons of God when we become the, into Christ. We now be, take that place. Jesus came down here on earth and then he was crucified on the cross and was put in the ground and the three days he was in the grave, I believe he went down to hell and he kicked the door open and he said, Satan, give me the keys. I want the keys to all these cells, all these people that you're, you have in here. And I got the, he's got the keys. And you know what? I, I think he went and he opened every cell door. Every cell door in hell. How many know hell is in a future place? Hell is a now place. Amen. There are people today, and I was there, that live in hell every day. They live in bondage. They live in captivity. They live in suffering. They live in pain. Amen? And the door is open. You see, the door is unlocked. But some of us don't have the willpower. We've been lied to. We think we're prairie chickens. See, an eagle will kick the door open because it's unlocked. See, we, our job down here to make disciples is to take those people that are captive in hell. Let them know that the door has been open. Amen? Let them know that the, the price has already been paid. Let them know that they're not prairie chickens. They're eagles. So we can see, we can, we, our job is to elevate people. Our job is to be in a position to elevate people. Amen? So I want us to turn in, our, in, your, in, your, in your hymnals, or we're going to have the words up on the screen, right? Can we get the words up on the screen? I want us to sing a song as we get ready to uh, have our Lord's Supper together this morning. And if the ushers will come and maybe sit in the front pews as we sing this song. And I want this song to be a dedication. It's Take My Life and Let It Be. Um, 348, 358 in your hymnal. We'll get the words up on the screen too. But I, I just want to go over some of the words in this song. How many know, know words mean something? Amen. How many know that, that, that music set to words is one of the most life-changing experiences that we can have? We all know that when we're feeling, that music can, you, music can make us feel a certain way. Amen? That's why God, God you, know, you know, Satan was a music leader in heaven. Amen? You got to watch those praise and worship leaders. Amen? <laughs> But this song, this song talks about surrender. It talks about realizing I'm not equal with God. God and I are on the same level. He's way above me. It says, take my life and let it be consecrated Lord, to you. you know what consecrated means? Set apart. You see, in order to be in this position, this blessed position, we got to separate. Remember the beginning of this whole chapter 5, we talked about how there was a separation. Jesus went up onto the mountain, and not all the multitudes came to him. Just a, a select group came to him, climbed up that mountain with him. 
there was a separation that took place. Consecrated Lord to thee, take my hands and let them move all at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of love. So he, he consecrates his hands to God. In chapter verse 2, he, he consecrates his feet. And chapter, th uh, chapter 3, verse 3, he consecrates his wealth. And in verse 4, he consecrates his will. Paul says, before we come and take the bread and take the cup, we need to examine ourselves. We need to check ourselves out. What a better way of, of, of doing that than to, as we sing this song, just, just give, give it all to you. Give all your, all your body to you, all that you do. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, first we need to submit our body as a living sacrifice. And then we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So stand and sing these four verses with me and then we'll go into our time of the Lord's Supper together. Father, that is our prayer today. Consecrate our lives. Set us apart. Set our hands and our feet to do thy will. Set our voice to sing your praises. Set our bodies and our hearts. Set our mind and our heart and our body. Let you be on the throne of our heart. Let you be the power behind what we think. And let you control what we do with our body. Lord, we just consecrate ourselves to you. As we come to this time of taking this, this Lord's Supper, this bread which represents your body in this cup which is in your blood we thank you for that and we bless you we bless each one here in jesus name amen you may be seated what we're going to do now is we're going to serve the elements we're going to get a little cup of juice and a little uh, piece of, of cracker so we're going to pass it all out we want you to hold it we're going to take it together as a family and then we'll have a thought for each one